AIOs like this one, which are all-in-one liquid cooling solutions for CPUs, come in all shapes and sizes. Or I suppose more specifically, their radiators do. I mean, sure, the blocks may look a bit different from brand to brand, but most of those do the same thing. An exception is in the Pure Loops case from Be Quiet, which integrates the pump into the tubing, allowing for a much sleeker, lower profile CPU block. You can also manually refill these AIOs, which is something you don't always see, but when it comes to cooling performance, the subject of today's video, let's be honest, the only factor usually involved is radiator size. You see, larger radiators have larger surface areas thanks to extra fins and longer channels, assuming we're sticking with the same form factor based on the 120 mm form factor specifically. And, and that's why we've partnered with Be Quiet in this video. They agreed to send us two of their 120 mm AIOs. Actually, they sent us three, but we tested the two more popular ones, the 120 millimeter AIO and the 240 millimeter AIO, which is essentially two 120s smushed together. And as you might expect, larger radiators generally perform better than smaller ones in closed systems. But how much better? And that's why these Pure Loop AIOs are here. We're gonna shove these into the exact same test bed housed in the exact same case and see just how far they go in the way of cooling our CPU. So we're working with an Intel Core i9-9900KS, which has been clocked to five gigahertz across all eight cores at stock with a fixed 1.35 volt V core. We're pairing it with a Z390 Designare from Gigabyte, 16 gigs of DDR4, and an RTX 20 DTI just for kicks. Both AIOs will be mounted in the exact same position and a carbonate pad will be used in place of traditional thermal paste to ensure consistency between runs. Now bear in mind that premium thermal compounds will yield better temperatures, but we're aiming more or less for consistency here and you'll see that we've actually locked fan curves in, in some of our tests. Uh, so I wouldn't take these temperatures you're about to see here as like in, you know indicators of performance. Uh, we're doing things specifically uh, to kind of level the playing field between the 120 and 140. Uh, so for some series of these tests, you're gonna see the fan curve locked to 50%. Uh, again, for the sake of consistency, with the exception of the pump, which will be running at 100% throughout. We'll be using IDA64 Engineer to place synthetic loads on our CPU, FPU, and cache, which are all part of the actual chip itself, and we'll stress it in 60 minute stints, recording peak package and core temps along the way. Oh, and in case you're wondering, we are leaving the left side panel on for a practical effect. You can find these parts linked below, by the way. Now, before we show you the results, it's important that uh, we cover a few basic thermodynamic principles, the primary of which being heat capacity in the case of these AIOs. The reason we use water in place of, say, alcohol or some kind of oil is because water has a very high heat capacity. It defines the amount of energy a substance can absorb before changing temperature. Water can absorb actually quite a bit of energy while still remaining relatively cool, which makes it a great candidate for liquid cooling solutions. But this is why you have to be careful when measuring CPU temperatures with an AIO. See, right when you start a test, the fluid in our loop is around room temperature and it will slowly rise because water again can absorb so much energy before increasing in temperature. It takes a longer time for water to heat up in, a, in the long run, essentially. Uh, so we're, we're not looking at fluid temperatures here. I don't want you to confuse the, the temperature chart you're about to see, but we should expect package temps in our CPU to rise steadily over time as fluid temps do up until the point that fluid temps no longer increase. So in order to get that accurate reading, we need to wait for around an hour so that that system can again fully equalize. Otherwise, CPU temps will appear lower than they really should for a workload like this one. So with these AIOs, you can see after a few minutes that temperatures haven't actually peaked yet. They're still slightly going up. And that's because again, that water is acting as our medium of heat exchange and takes a while to warm up. And this chart follows a pretty standard trend as well. The 120 mil AIO, I'm sure this is no surprise, it struggled to keep our 9900KS under T-junction, which is understandable, again, if you recall that we're using A, a carbonate pad, B, that we're locking fan curves to 50%, and C, that we're manually overclocking to five gigahertz across all eight cores, that's a lot for a uh, measly 120 mil to uh, handle. Anyway, stepping up to the 240, pulse temps down by a whopping six degrees at peak. At six degrees is a lot in CPU temperature world. That suggests that it's better suited for this task. Surprise, surprise. Now remember, a bit of a disclaimer, every chip is different, and even if we have the same skew, every 9900K is binned a bit differently. Uh, so your mileage will definitely vary. Don't assume that these temps are the exact temps you'll see with your CPU. Uh, but at least this gives you a frame of reference when shopping around for your next AIO. Uh, another point to consider, is sound. Now, these AIOs are fitted with Pure Wings 2 fans, which are silent in their own right, but the 240mm AIO has two of them instead of one. And since the accompanying rad space is essentially doubled, these fans can in theory turn at around half the rate of a single fan in a 120mm setup to achieve a similar cooling effect. 
This is a different way to look at the advantage of a larger AIO. So quieter operation for similar cooling performance, right? You could either say that the 240 mil cools this particular CPU by six degrees more uh, than the 120 mil at the same apparent loudness since we fixed fan RPM in our earlier test. Or you could say that the 120 mil runs around 13 decibels higher, or roughly two and a half times louder, uh, apparent loudness, than a 240 mil at roughly the same level of cooling performance. And that brings us to the last important distinction between these three, price. So the 120 mil variant is going to be the cheapest, right? The fewest materials. The 240 mil variant is going to be a bit more expensive and pretty obvious reasons here. And then the 360 mil is generally going to be more expensive. And that's usually how it works unless you find a, a, a deal, an exception, a sale somewhere. Uh, additional build materials, additional fans, you get it. That all factors into this cost. But it's important to weigh this delta against the advantages of a larger radiator when planning your build. If reviews point to your CPU of choice running pretty toasty, uh, it may make a bit more sense to pair it with a larger AIO. Something like a 240 or 360 mil, excuse me, will generally do. But if your chip has a low TDP, say it's a Ryzen 5 3600, uh, and you don't plan to overclock it much, right? A 120 mil generally will do just fine, and it will actually stay fairly quiet. And Be Quiet <laughs> offers several form factors uh, of its Pure Loop AIO. You can learn more about the Be Quiet Pure Loop lineup in this video's description if you're interested. Uh, big thanks to them again for sponsoring this video, and I hope you had a chance to maybe learn something here. Consider liking this one, subscribing, and clicking that bell. That would be appreciated, and uh, that way you're notified of future releases. My name is Greg. Thanks for learning with me.